The coast of the Levant hides secrets that go back to the dawn of mankind. Most of our distant ancestors traveled through the coastal plain at the foot of the Carmel Range as our species, Homo sapiens, gradually took to the four corners of the world. This natural pathway between Africa and Asia and Europe has seen more cultures, more varied living conditions, and more upheavals than any other region in the world. Here, to travel back in time, one only has to dig. Successive generations of humans have left traces of their passage, from crude flint axes to objects more elaborate and more precious. Yet the real treasures of the region aren't to be found underground, but underwater. We are 10 kilometers south of Haifa, Israel, lying offshore the little town of Atlit. The research vessel Medex is about to drop anchor at the foot of an impregnable fortress built by the Knights Templars, itself erected on the foundations of a more ancient Phoenician harbor. The mystery of Atlit starts with the discovery of an unusual mound of stone, half a kilometer from the shore, under 10 meters of water. The discoverer, Dr. Ehud Galili, is an archaeologist and an accomplished diver. His uncanny sixth sense has always helped him to discern revealing signs of a find in the strange universe of marine landscapes. But Dr. Galili doesn't yet suspect that he is about to make the discovery of his lifetime. First of all, there was the invention of the aquarium. Then I was born. <laughs> For me, these are two important events. Uh, first, I started as a snorkel diver. I started to, I joined my father in the Association for, uh, for Underwater Archaeology. Responded 61. And very soon I realized that I wanted to explore the sea. I wanted to dive and to find scenes that nobody had ever found before. There are very, very rare places on land where no, you can go and you know that you are the first one. In the sea, anywhere you go, you are the first to be there. First of all, as a boy who was looking for coins and artifacts, or the passion of collection and fighting, and then as a researcher who wanted to know the background and the story beyond these artifacts, not only to put these nice artifacts on the television and watch them, but tell you where did they came from, how they were done, who were the mariners, uh, who were the fishermen, what technologies they used. All these uh, questions we can answer by studying these finds that we found from the sea. Scores of relics have been retrieved by Dr. Galili or his colleagues. Anchors from all eras, chariot wheels, ingots, cannonballs. But they came mostly from the endless chain of wreckages that plagued the sailors for the centuries. On this coast, the lack of natural harbors makes the winter westerly winds ruthless. After every storm, new areas are exposed and new treasures are found. The main idea is to wait for the sea to do the job of excavating. The day of the discovery, one of those big storms had partly exposed the strange rocky formation from the sand. Our scientific treasure hunter knew immediately that this was no wreck. Who could have had the motivation and means to go and build something there, so deep under the sea? Phoenicians? Romans? Templars? Arabs? This question intrigued Dr. Galili. A few years earlier, in the same area, 
he had helped to retrieve the ram of a war galley, a half-ton bronze behemoth. The Phoenicians had an important trading post in Atlit, using the islet close to the peninsula so their boats could land with sufficient draft. This is the these merchants were foresighted mariners and savvy builders, but none of their structures had been found so far from the shore. The means and determination of Templars could more easily account for such a feat, but to what end? During the Crusades, Chateau Pellerin was an imposing fortress with many lines of defense. This castle was so well protected that it was never taken. When the knights deserted the Levant, it is said that weeks went by before the Muslims realized that the place was empty. The first dig by Galili and his team reveals quite a different story, a different prehistory, shall we say. The site predates the Iron Age, the Bronze Age, or even the Pottery Age. This is Stone Age, way beyond 6,000 years. First of all, we came to a tomorrow's or a tower of about 80 centimeter high, built of undressed stones, without cement, of course. A line one near the other in circles. And then when we removed it and started to excavate, we came upon a, a well which is constructed from very sophisticated way. And the same as uh, wells that were built today. Stone Age is a general term that encompasses millions of years of evolution from cavemen to civilization. The end of this long prehistory is marked by a deep revolution, the Neolithic, the New Stone Age. Under 12 meters of salt water, Dr. Galili's discovery appears to be the most ancient submerged Neolithic site ever found. Dr. Israel Hershkowitz, a medical doctor specializing in prehistoric pathology, was convinced that the stone mound would turn out to be a burial place. He was wrong about the mound, but his hopes wouldn't be dashed for long. The best moment in Atlitian was when we excavated the first human skeleton was an outstanding experience. I mean that we knew that there is probably there is a burial pit over there and we start moving the clay. Slowly, slowly we expose the skull and then we expose the rest of the skeleton. But interestingly, once we expose the full skull, the skull had a, a huge hole, you know, at the center. Probably a, a post-mortem damage to the skull and a fish came out of it, you know, out of the skull. It's a very fishing idea. If you take a modern skull, the people of Atletia would look similar to present-day Levantine population. They will look more or less the same as you and I. Can you help me with this? These first finds were only the right. tip of the iceberg. This is the map of no the one could have expected map. what mm -hmm. was to follow. Now, you see the, the village is 40,000 square meters. Mm -hmm. Now this is also covered, everything is covered. All this mm -hmm. is covered by sand. This yeah. information was gathered after uh, 25 years mm -hmm. of exposure. Sure, it's uh, like, a, as you say, it's like a jig jigsaw puzzle. Each the deep sea of sand along the coastline is always on the move. Yeah. So we go and we this often it. allows for a very short and exploration and window. It took over 25 years of work before one of the finest jewels of prehistory gave up all of its secrets. The site was called Atlit Yam, Atlit on the Sea, in Hebrew. What? 
Before these images were shot, almost no one outside a specialized scientific community was aware of the importance or even the existence of the site. Underwater expeditions require much more resources than digging on firm ground. The preparation is a logistical puzzle on its own. For each mission, a small village has to be erected on the beach to accommodate the researchers, the divers, and their equipment. The ascent of mankind implies the whole world. Besides Israeli researchers, scientists convert here from Germany, Scotland, Ireland, France, Canada, Scandinavia, or Bulgaria. The current mission was initiated by the European Splash Coast program, dedicated to the study of continental shelves. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Atlantia Fit School. For the major part of prehistory, during the last ice age, continental shelves everywhere were above water level. Mankind's first roads were never far from coastlines, so up to 85% of all the earliest archaeological sites are now located under the sea. The site is located about 400 meters offshore here to the west behind this van with the boat. A little about 200 meters south In the time of Atliyam, the Levantine coastal plains stretched up to a kilometer further west towards the sea. I'm really excited about my first dive. Uh, I'm not sure what to expect, how warm it is, and uh, visibility or condition of the remains down there. So I'm quite nervous. <laughs> it's my first marine archaeology dive. We are now in the North Bay of Atlit. We are going to dive in the submerged Neolithic settlement at Atlit Yam. It is a 9,000 year old settlement from the pre-pottery Neolithic period. In, at that period, people didn't have pottery. Of course, they didn't have metal. They didn't know how to write but they produced all kinds of tools, from bone, from stone, and this is actually what we found. Underwater archaeology, relative to sort of traditional land archaeology, it is a new field, like the work that uh, Ehud Galili and his team have produced here at Lidiam. Um, has really helped the field of submerged prehistory to be recognized on an international level, and I think it's only going to expand. We, um, we set up the, the dredger, um, and it's just a question of hitting a very large aluminum pipe, unbalanced, sort of, the head where the valve is, and it's pretty heavy, and so they said, right, we're gonna, we're gonna go down, you take this end, I got this end, we'll go down together. He gives me the super heavy end, and I went Phew, right down to the bottom, and I thought, yeah, that was funny. Uh, so I was pretty awkward initially, but then we got down, uh, they set up the basically the, the dredge line, a couple of buoys to keep it sort of buoyant. It's, it's actually a nice setup. And then um, that took a while and it's our first working dive together so there's a bit of communication. It's like your first day on any job, you have to figure out who you're working with and how you're working together and all of that. Except you can't talk, so you're trying to, you do this and you watch me and all that stuff and by the end of the dive we had it. Over the years, Dr. Galili's teams have contributed to the fine-tuning of reliable equipment to move and sieve through the thousands of cubic meters of sand that covered the ruins. Diving with a hood 
It's like diving with someone who has the experience of a 60-year-old and the energy of a 25-year-old. One of the peculiarities of archaeology is the unavoidable systematic destruction of evidence. Archaeologists are entitled to one single attempt. Our team members are forced to work slowly with extra caution and thoroughness, looking for the smallest clues. Depth of the layer, soil composition, and even the relative position of remains are essential to recreate the past. No one knows under which stone an archaeological find is hiding. The 40,000 square meters of Atlit Yam are an archaeological mine. Architecture, technology, lifestyle. Wherever they dig, Dr. Galili's research teams discover new clues about this year-round sedentary site. Twice as old as the Egyptian pyramids, the well discovered by Galili is the most ancient example of this type of construction ever found. This first well turns out to be an archaeologist's dream come true. Instead of the expected sand and rocks that should have filled it, scores of carved objects, animal remains, and other man-made items were found, giving a fair chronicle of the daily life of the 30-odd families that used to live here all year round. Archaeologists, all of Atlit Yam artifacts are deemed in situ finds. Objects found in context, where they were abandoned 9,000 years ago. Là, on a trouvé quelque chose d'intéressant. So this is a, a flint. Pebble, it looks like you have the cortex here, and we have so, yeah, definitely. These are flakes. This one is a slightly older, but it, they are all man made. Let's say that this is a big core of flint, like this. this is a core. So you prepare, make some preparation, and then one strike, tick, and you have the blade. In the sole sector dedicated to flint tool making, a sample of 8,755 artifacts has been identified, from flint flakes to functional tools. These are artifacts that we found in Atlitiam. It is only a, a random collection to just to demonstrate the nature of the artifacts that we have here. This, for example, is a big fascia. You have all the surface polished with pressure flakes. It takes a lot of skill and professional uh, flint uh, napper to do this. Uh, maybe every, in, in 1,000 people there is only one who is specialist for this. And this knowledge is, was transferred from generation to generation. And it is very, very sophisticated, very, very prestige tool. There were arrowheads. We have two kinds of arrowheads, and these are biblos. These are biblos, you can see the arrowheads, how nice they are work, perfect. They were hafted, of course, and they were used for hunting. And these are the facial axes, and they were used for woodwork. They were used for cutting woods, cutting trees, and maybe uh, producing boats, who knows? Because we know that these people had the capability of sailing in the sea. Because the type of fish that we discovered, some of them are deep sea, and deep sea fish, and they require 
knowledge in sailing. So they probably had both, but we didn't find the both. Because organic material is not always preserved. The waterproofing effect of clay has helped the archaeologists in many ways. Fragile remains such as fish bones are abundant. Over 6,000 fish remains have been lifted from the bottom, allowing for very detailed interpretations. With its characteristic retractile dorsal spine, triggerfish is the most common species found in Atlit Yam. The average size of the specimen analyzed matches the expected type of catch using a net. They had the ships, they were fishermen, they were good fishermen. We found here a lot of uh, fishermen equipment. And also needles, which they probably saw the nets and they live on uh, fishing, they live uh, by the sea. You know, there are no evidence for both whatsoever, you know. How can you tell from the human, from the bone, that the people were engaged in seafaring, you know, that they were really using boats, you know, and whether they were able or capable of reaching the island of Cyprus, for example. And there are specific diseases, you know, especially in the vertebral column that tells you the posterior part of the vertebra, the neural arch, so that there is enough evidence in, in the skeleton to tell you almost everything about the people who were uh, living uh, at Atlit Yam. Typical wear on specific vertebrae and larger muscle attachments on high limb bones are compatible with long hours paddling in a boat. You see, if you take this mandible, for example, you see we, here we have motors. One of, of the side of the crown is totally eroded. This specific teeth was heavily attracted by some cultural behavior. Because we know that people were using their teeth not just to process the food, but actually to prepare fishnet, for example, or to prepare baskets, for example. But what you call cultural attrition is very different from what you call food attrition. Up until the last century, cultural attrition of teeth used to weave fibers or tan skins could still be seen in some ethnic groups. To weave their nets, fishermen of Atlit Yam relied on fiber. These types of remains are amongst the most difficult for an archaeologist to establish. But researchers in Atlit Yam were lucky enough to find carbonized plant fibers still clearly identifiable after 9,000 years. Flax fiber, for instance, could be used for ropes, nets, and maybe even clothing. Such organic remains, as well as charcoal or bones, can be used to obtain precise data that provides further details on the evolution of ancient settlements. The clock used here is an unstable form of carbon that decays in a known and regular pattern, carbon-14. This is a bone, very well preserved, of a small mammal, probably a mouse. So this picking has to be done very carefully and you get a lot of information. Apart from hand collecting material from the surface of the site and excavating inside the wells, and in that sediment we found animal bones which we wouldn't have collected from the sea floor. Uh, without the dredger. It's one of the first sites where we have um, almost the full complement of domestic animals, which means sheep, goat, cattle, pig, so that we can see within the site the complete, um, if you like, development of domestic animals, uh, beginning with animals that are wild and hunted through to uh, animals that are fully domesticated. And so we have uh, one of the more impressive pieces, which is a horn core, a horn of uh, cattle. And this is probably uh, wild uh, cattle, uh, what we call an auroch. 
So this is from before animals were domesticated. Uh, also from the surface of the site, uh, are horn cores of goats. And this would have been uh, a wild goat or a very, very primitive goat. We can compare it here, and you can see that the horn core is very straight and leaves the skull uh, right above the front of the, the eyes, as opposed to a domestic goat. You can see that the horn cores go backwards and they also have a twist. So what we're dealing here is really one of the earliest points in the domestication of goats. When we look at material from the wells, we're dealing with the end of the site. It's a later phase of occupation. And essentially, the material that we find there in terms of animals is slightly different. All the animals in the wells are domestic. We see the transition within the site. And that is a unique feature. Pollen and seeds extracted from the sediments also reflect the agricultural transition and give an idea of the vegetation and climate that was the norm here in prehistoric time. The average temperature was three degrees lower than today, with greater differences between the seasons and colder seawater. Once they reached the bottom of the well, the archaeologists had enough clues to reconstitute the sequence of events that forced it to be abandoned. With the sea rising, salt water percolated up through the sand and contaminated the fresh water table under the well. It's very hard to abandon your house, to abandon your village, so naturally we assume that they struggle, they try to solve problems. And actually we found evidence in the well of trying to cope with the problems. Those who had spent so much effort building it tried to restore its function by raising its base in vain. The sea was so close, so the well was no use anymore. So at that moment, they still used it, but as a garbage pit. The sea level kept rising slowly, but inexorably. One wonders, where did the water come from? It came from ice. When ice keeps piling up on continents, the world's sea level goes down. In the days of Atlip Yam, the melting phase of the last ice age was well underway. But North America was still covered by the most imposing of the ancient ice giants. Glaciers have left behind deep scars in the granite of the north shore of the St. Lawrence River in Quebec. They are vivid evidence of the scope of the planetary upheaval that had repercussions on early civilizations settled near shores. At the rate of half a meter per century, the rising sea eventually forced the people of Atlit Yam to abandon the land of their ancestors. The Canadian glacier would keep feeding the sea until the Bronze Age some 3,000 years later. To date, on the abandoned site, researchers have identified over 70 structures of various functionalities and dwellings with rectangular foundations, of which only the first row of stones remain. At that time, during the preparatory and Neolithic uh, period, people used to bury their dead underneath the living floor, which is very interesting if you come to think about it. The notion of the idea of separating the world of the dead and the world of the living is quite a late notion. So in Neolithic site, it is quite easy to find human skeleton because once you find the structure, you know for sure underneath the floor you will find human skeleton. The graves at Adlit Yam didn't contain only bones. Sealed in the anaerobic environment of clay for thousands of years, these remains present the best preserved human and viral DNA samples of prehistory.
Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, today is going to be a bit of a charged day. Uh, first thing, Jonathan, is the first safety. Hey, who told me about two minutes before I went diving that we were going to start to excavate the new well, the feature uh, number 80, which he just discovered this year? Every dive over Atlit Yam brings about its share of discovery. This new structure, spotted during the mission preparation, may turn out to be a well, a storage pit, or a burial site. Despite the risk and the long hours spent underwater, diving is a passion for underwater archaeologists. That does not relieve them from the tedious monk work generally associated with classic archaeology. Et que présentement on est en train de trier le matériel organique qu'on a trouvé euh, ce matin, et que là on est dans l'argile pour vraiment aller chercher euh, matériel organique. Oh. Make, make sure that you don't break it while uh, while doing it. You have to fill it by. There is a high probability that it is the same artifact. It was broken in antiquity and maybe dumb. You see, this is a spatula. And believe me, I didn't dive here the last night and put it there. <laughs> you have to trust me. Caroline, you are the lucky one. Yes. The most important chapter of prehistory is surely the period that sees nomadic hunter-gatherer tribes switching to a brand new mode of subsistence, agriculture. Of the thousands of plant seeds found, there were many kilograms of domesticated wheat, but also barley, lentils, and chickpeas. In the beginning, the inhabitants must have gathered wild grains as a hedge against periods of want. But the process of harvesting and planting in the same area slowly altered the plant characteristics, domesticating them. Probably without intent, the early prehistoric farmers were busy fostering hybrids and artificial selection on their seeds. These are secret blades. See the shine? See that it's, there is a glossy hill at the edge. This is the original shine created by cutting wheat. So it stays like this and you can still see the polish after 9,000 years. Thus, the small community can feed itself and prosper all year long. So much so that life expectancy in Atlit Yam gets a significant boost. At the beginning of the summer, a decline in fishing activity makes way for grain harvest. 
followed by the slaughtering of animals born in the spring. The group then moves on to fruit and nut gathering before a fall seafood phase, followed by the collection of wild legumes in winter. As the year passes, the inhabitants sow grain, then take to the sea, fishing once again. In all practical senses, Dr. Hershkovitz's lab has conducted an autopsy on all human remains excavated in Atlitiam. The information is coded in the bone, like a huge tape recorder that records almost every event in your life, and you just need to know how to read the information in the bone. You take a film of a male and a female, it's not just that one is longer than the other, it makes sense. I mean, Bone growth, pelvic bone articulation, long bone fine structure, than, tooth attrition than, than, than are all clues to determine age, okay. sex, and general health of individuals. Combining all the factors allows us to conclude that few children reached adulthood. And this was at the late 19. Uh, Udi entered to the water and he found some skeleton and he called me and then we took the next day. When I arrived, I looked around and I saw there is another skull of a baby. He has, uh, in the bones, you can see that he suffers from some infectional disease. Bacterial DNA and bone analysis have established the oldest cases of malaria and tuberculosis, which took the lives of this mother and her young child. The marked improvement of food sources implied an increase in pregnancy, yet a higher mortality rate for females. While boys who did become adults could live up to 50, This is a remarkable life expectancy considering other settlements around the same period. Those living in Atlitz benefited from almost everything of what is now referred to as the Mediterranean diet. Mastering agriculture is the main factor by which some seven million humans at the time of Atlit Young became the seven billion of today. וכשירדנו למים, הגענו לתחתית, לקרקעית, מצאנו מחשוף גדול, והתחלנו להסתובב על המחשוף. ובאיזשהו שלב נעצרנו, ואני עם הברכיים ירדתי לרצפה. ופתאום בא אודי ונותן לי מכה, מעיף אותי הצידה, ממש ב... ומראה לי שאני עם הברך על, לי זה נראה כמו אבן, אבל הסתבר מאוחר יותר שזה גולגולת של בן אדם. Well, what, what we see here basically are three skulls that, found, that were found uh, together, and you can see that base of the skull of the center were plastered. Basically they used some kind of limes to create a mask. And they modeled the face, you can see the nose, you can see the teeth, and actually they used seashell, you know, to create the eyes and the iris at the center. Now, those skulls are very interesting because at that period, uh, people used to bury their dead within the living quarters. After several years, they took just a skull, created a beautiful face, probably put some kind of a twig over the rest of, of the skull. So imagine to yourself that these skulls stood in a, on a platform at the center of the village and together with it they were very impressive. Those skulls are the first evidence of what we call ancestral cult, worshipping your ancestor by saying that my ancestors were living here and my great-great ancestors they were also living here by establishing a chain of generation from present to the past, you establish your right on the property. After years of successful digs, some thought there was little chance of learning much more. But that was without factoring in the whim of winter storms. During a routine survey dive, Dr. Galili and his father Joseph stumbled upon three rocks protruding from the sandy bottom. It looked like nothing they had ever discovered so far. It was not a house, 
not a tumulus and even less a storage pit. Yeah. This structure, yep. and it is associated this probably with all this complex. This add a whole new dimension mm. to the richness of the site. New. Mm. We know one position and we make triangulations. We put the baseline on the, under the water. The only way to get to the bottom of it yeah. is to then remove the tons to the of sand that cover the whole sector. In situ. The protruding stones turn out to be the largest ever exposed in Atlit Yam. It is clearly man-made, a megalith, an erected stone altar. This is the spiritual heart of this small Neolithic settlement. In the periphery, many hearths were found along with buildings, a high concentration of burial sites, and an intriguing narrow corridor, 20 meters long. The structure with many burials, we have Dr. Clive Rager is burial. specialized yeah, yeah, yeah. in it's archaeoastronomy yep. and has and worked on various prehistoric sites around here, the world. For one point, say the altar stone, and um, one of the things here is that there are these two long parallel walls that lead in the general direction of the altar stone. Uh, and very strange, they seem to have built these two long walls only a meter apart with and what appears to have been a compressed clay surface. So it seems people were walking along there. And the orientation of that, as far as I could discover before I came out here, just looking at the plans and the, the maps, this was roughly oriented in the direction of sunrise on the June solstice, so on the, on the longest day of the year. Survival of people living here depended more and more on agriculture. Had they already observed the link between season cycles and the sun? One of the problems of, of dealing with uh, prehistoric sites and worrying about how they relate to the sky is that the sky has changed. Dr. Ruggles uses special astronomic software that spins the planets backward 9,000 times in order to see the sky the people of Atlit Yam were seeing nine millenniums ago. His method was already successful in establishing a solid link between astronomy and Stonehenge the famous British circle of stone. The archaeoastronomer needs to infer position from marine charts composed with compass error and reinvent the aspect the horizon had from a point situated offshore 12 meters below the sea. Dr. Ruggles' calculation shows that the sun did rise between the two walls once a year, but not necessarily exactly on the summer solstice. A few days before or after, but it did happen within the longest days of the year. Pure luck or deliberate effort? Closer to the altar, the more it is excavated, the more elements and features are exposed. It is a place that prompts respect and contemplation. A few stones have fallen with time, but the two meter monoliths weighing a ton each were erected like sentinels in an arc around a central stone with a depression around it. Vestiges of fresh waterweed and mollusks were found within, indicative of water symbolically surrounding the main stone. On what is presumed to be the front of the altar, many flat stones with cup marks are deployed. Bowls for offerings? For social activities? One cannot say.
The hall is reminiscent of a mini Stonehenge, 5,000 years before the erection of that great monument. The discovery of an entire zone seemingly dedicated to spiritual or ritual activities is an indication that the people of Atlipiam gave themselves the means to preserve collective knowledge, a key to the success of the agricultural tradition. on an experiment with the hopes of making other underwater finds more predictable. We finished to excavate everything that we planned to and we need even more. We made the experiments, we took the core samples and we made the jet drillings. Dr. Galili's team hopes to help the new generation of underwater archaeologists to find other sites like this one. Evidence for the bones testify to a very peaceful community. We don't have evidence for trauma whatsoever, which is quite strange because people were expecting at least the first uh, farming community to be more aggressive, protecting their territories uh, in a way. But at least for Matilitium, we can uh, conclude that the level of aggression was very low. On the Levantine coast, the sun doesn't rise exactly at the same place it used to. Atlipiam findings are casting a new light on the dawn of human civilization and on people who might have been ancestors for many of us today. Whether or not we find another drowned city as old as this one, Atlipiam will remain an example a source of motivation for future generations of archaeologists to look for some of mankind's first steps at the bottom of the sea. <laughs>